I'm Mexican American and and Jewish. You said there could have been some Jewish roots in your past. Is that right? Oh, there definitely is yeah. by my mom's side. Right. Right. Well, your mom had a Jewish fuerza when she just would take <laughs> no for an answer. How do you think your mom most influenced your character and your music? In every possible way that you can think of, uh, but especially her prayer. She had a certain way of sitting down and then she would say, God is going to give me this and he's going to do it. And we were like, uh oh, there she goes. You know, and you can almost, you can just about feel my mother pulling God's robe all the way to the ground and like, you're going to do this. And we were saying, man, you know, how, how, how? next thing you know, it's, it's, it's there, you know. So she had this conviction, this diligent conviction. Uh, her own, I have never known anyone to pray the way she prayed with such knowing. You also talk about in the book, I get a lot of anger um, against her because she saw your dad and you and she shamed you a couple of times as a result. How'd you get past that anger with her to see only the light? Um, it took a while, but when it did, it was the greatest gift that we could have given each other. Something just shifted in both of us. When you first started to make money and everybody else in your band was buying up motorcycles and hot things, you kept a promise to your mom. How important was that to you? Oh, it was the first, first and foremost. You know, as soon as I got the first royalty check, and I was like, oh my God, look at all the zeros to the right, you know? And uh, I went and got her to the house, and uh, I, I felt so divine. You know, it's divine to give that which means the most to those who mean the most. She took you to that park that day, and your life changed because you heard music that, mm -hmm. unlike the violin, really resonated with you and took you to the guitar. What did that do to you that day as a kid listening? What can you recapture what that felt like? It uh, woke me up to my destiny, literally. Um, I, held, I heard the sound and what it did to my molecules, to my body, and uh, I felt the sound trembling towards the trees and the the sky and the church and the park and everything, the cars. Carlos, when you, um, when you think of your kind of beginning, do you think you'd be able to play the transformative and, and transcendent way that you do had you not had the difficult childhood that you've had? No. No. Do you need that to play the kind of music you play? You don't need to suffer, but you need to um, resonate with all the intensity of your emotions. Music is about energy, you know. People trying to sell all this energy on TV all the time, you know. But if you replace all those pills and replace it with passion, I mean real, just pure passion, you don't need none of those pills that they're selling, you know. Let's talk about that. Do you think, I mean, you talk a lot about your mescaline and your drug days, and mm -hmm. um, could you have been able to touch the place that you go to in music had you not gone through your drug days? No. So it was necessary? I think so. Uh, because how can you know how to play three-dimensional unless you go in there? You know, most people paint like this or black and white or, you know, now they have digital, they still run around, you know. Uh, so you have to go th through it to get to it. <laughs> do you regret those days? No, I wish, you know, I, I wish I had more time to do some more. <laughs> 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 when you get up on that stage at Woodstock, Santana was not known other than in San Francisco. He didn't have an album out yet. They still called them albums back then. Um, and you were high as a kite. And I read somewhere you were praying to God to please just keep it together so that you can get up there and do what you had to do. What happened up there changed your life? Can you describe the zone you went into and where you tapped into in, in <laughs> on that fateful day? The only closest way to describe something like that is, is that you become incubated. You're incubated with, I only, I, I hear myself saying, God, please help me. Please help me. There's 550,000 people here 
and I, I'm in a state of high, really, really altered states. Um, if you would only just please keep me in time and in tune, I promise I'll never do this again. <laughs> Did you keep that promise? <laughs> of course not. Uh, but then you hear the music coming, you know, you hear the music coming, like rain coming and hitting the windows. You hear the music, and then you hear it in your, in your uh, subconscious, then you hear it in your heart, and then you hear it in your fingers, and then you hear it in your guitar, and then you hear it in the amplifier, and you hear it in the speakers, and you hear it bombard the PA, the, the public, 550,000 people, and then it comes back to you, all of it at the same time. So you feel it like you're in it. You're it, you're like you're it. it. <laughs> You're not, you, it's, did you know your life changed that day? No, no. When did you know? Um, probably when I was with Devin Wilson, Jimi Hendrix's uh, lady, and she said, hey man, what are you doing? I says, oh, you just, I just got in. He says, I know, I want to take you to the movies. Like, take me to the movies. She's Jimi Hendrix's lady. So we went to see this Woodstock movie, and she was like constantly saying, wait till you see you and, and you hear your band, you know? And then, okay, here it comes, here it comes. You guys are next. And I was like, okay, you know? And when we came on, I was like, oh my God, because I don't remember anything. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, dang, you know? <laughs> Whoa, you know, and so I'm saying, oh my God, you know, I look like, like a termite. I'm making some ugly faces and, <laughs> And they got this camera that makes me look like an ant. And I was like, you know, that's all I can remember is like how I look, you know? And it's like, and then I started focusing on the sound. And then she goes, Jimmy loved it. He thought you guys were great. And he just loved it. He loved your energy. And I was like, oh. Jimmy Hendrix. Mm hmm. So, you know, I, I love those two words validation and being adored. Those two words are extremely important to humans. Let me ask you a question. So you talk a lot about Jimi Hendrix and Coltrane and BB and all the greats. When did you realize you were in that esteemed company? Not looking at them from outside, but you were among them, their peers, that kind of greatness, that vessel to share talent. I still don't see myself in that, uh, or totally like that. I, I'm still, there's a child in me who's trying to get in, and there's a spirit in me who says, totally the same. Yeah, but when you've sold hundreds of millions of records and you're considered the, among the top guitarists worldwide of all time, and you talk of Coltrane as a flame keeper and Hendrix as a flame keeper, do you not see yourself in the same light? I do now because I know without a, without a doubt, you know, You're I've been saying. You're so safe. shy. You uh, preach. We are all of that light. We're children of God. I'm adored. I am who I am, Carlos Santana. And you're still shy about it. Well, you know, because um, there's a part of me who feels without a doubt that when my time is come to let go of this body, I am going to get a standing ovation from all of them. <laughs> <laughs>